Up YouTube, official gaming network, and welcome to episode 32 of our Mario game in Java tutorial. Last episode, we implemented a power star into our game. This episode, we're going to be implementing particle and trail effects that are going to go with our power star power up. But yeah, uh, when we left off, uh, we actually made a power star, but there's one problem with it. It's not a bug, but I'll show you the problem. So I'm just get our star. Yeah, so right now uh, we got in the star. We're invincible. Uh, we can kill enemies uh, without a problem. But the problem is, how can we tell if we're invincible or not? Uh, we need a way to indicate uh, or tell the user that the player is invincible. Because if we get the star and uh, you know the player's like not having any effects on it, or it visually doesn't show that the player is invincible, then how is the user playing our game gonna know that, uh, you know, our player is invincible? So yeah, in this episode, uh, we're gonna be implementing some particle and trail effects to indicate that uh, we're actually invincible. And uh, if we go into GIMP, oh, don't know why it's so small. But uh, anyway, as you, you can see that I've created a little particle effect sort of sprites. Yeah, that's the uh, particle effect. Well, the sprites for the particle effect we're going to be implementing uh, today. And uh, the trail effect, uh, we don't have a sprite for because, well, we already have a sprite. How the trail will work is that uh, every tick we would spawn a trail uh, at the exact coordinates and the width and height of our player. And, uh, and the sprite of the trail will be uh, the sprite that is rendering for our player at the moment. And before we get into this episode, uh, you know, I made some uh, particle effect sprites. And uh, because I made sprites, we have to create a sprite array because we're using uh, multiple sprites for, you know, the particles. So we'll make a public static sprite array. And uh, we're going to call it particle. And we're going to go into our init method, set particle equal to a new sprite array. And uh, our particle animation has a six sprites in it so we'll put six in the square brackets and uh, of course uh, create a for loop to set each sprite in the uh, particle array to an actual sprite so we can use it so oh, for i is less than particle dot length i plus plus and uh, we'll set a particle with an index of i well, that wasn't explained very well. Well, we've done this before. You should know what it means. It's pretty basic. Anyway, I'll set uh, particle i equal to a new sprite. Uh, the x coordinate will be i plus 1. I'm pretty sure the y coordinate is uh, 14. And the sprite sheet is, of course, sheet. And uh, so, yeah, now we're going to go into our tile class and create our tile array. So we'll go into our tile package, create a new class, and we're going to call it trail. And uh, of course, uh, we need to make it extend tile because, you know, trail is going to be a tile. And uh, we need to add the necessary abstract methods, render and tick. And of course, add the constructor. So now uh, we're going to initialize some variables. Well, actually one variable, but anyway. Uh, we're going to be creating a private, private float, and we're going to call it alpha and we're gonna no actually i won't declare it yet i'll just explain what a float is in case you haven't heard of it because uh we haven't really used it in this series before uh what pretty much a float is it's pretty much a double but with less memory i'm pretty sure a double in java can go up to 15 decimal places but um a float only has a uh, half the memory of a double so uh, it can only go up to i think five or six decimal places. And we need to uh, use a float because uh, some methods we're gonna be using in this episode uh, will take in floats. And uh, we're actually gonna set our uh, alpha float equal to 1.0. And the reason why we get an error is because uh, we're trying to specify a value that will be used in a double variable for a float variable. 
So to make this a uh, double value, a float value, all you have to do is put f on the end of our value or number. And that will just uh, cast or turn our number into a float. The alpha value is pretty much uh, the transparency or opacity level of images. Just letting you guys know, images with no transparency at all uh, has an alpha value of 1. And uh, images that are fully transparent, or they're pretty much invisible, uh, they have an alpha value of 0. And we're actually giving our trail an alpha value because we're going to make our trail fade out. Well, of course, because we want to make our trail fade out, uh, we have to decrease the alpha value with every tick. So, uh, with every tick, uh, we'll decrease the alpha value by 0 0.05. We don't need to put an F on the end, by the way. It's only when we're initializing floats. So just type alpha minus equals 0 0.05 into your tick method, and that will take away uh, 0 0.05 from our alpha float every tick. And uh, we're going to make an if statement below that line of code. We're going to be checking if alpha is less than 0 0.6 and if no 0 0.06 we'll make a 0 0.05 and uh, if that's true then uh, we're just going to type die so if our alpha value is less than 0 0.05 then uh, we're pretty much going to uh, kill our delete our trail because it's faded out anymore we can't see it anymore what's the point of keeping it there and if we keep it there, eventually all the trails will pile up and it will get really laggy. Before our constructor, we actually have to create a buffered image. So, uh, under our private float alpha, uh, we'll create a private buffered image. We'll set it. No, we'll just call it image. And I uh, will actually set it in our constructor. So, our trail constructor will actually take in a buffered image. And we're going to call it image. So after handler handler in our trails constructor, just type buffered image image. And in the constructor, we'll set this dot image equal to image. Now, uh, what we're going to do in our trails render method is that we're going to actually create a graphics 2D object. Now, what a graphics 2D object, it's, bas it's basically like the graphics objects we usually use. But the difference is, Graphics 2D has a uh, you know variables and methods that graphics sometimes doesn't. And one of the methods we're going to be calling in this episode uh, can only be called using a graphics 2D object. So we're going to have to create a graphics 2D object by casting graphics into a graphics uh, 2D. And uh, we've actually used casting before, and uh, I'll show you where. Uh, it's in fact uh, in our player class uh, when we were implementing a jumping into our game and a gravity, etc. Let me find. Where is it? Yeah, there it is. So uh, you can see that our gravity variable was a double and we had to set our val y equal to the value of gravity. But because uh, val y can be an integer and we're trying to, and we're trying to specify val y with a double, we had to we have to cast gravity as an integer, so uh, gravity will be turned into an integer, which I'm pretty sure it just uh, rounds it off to the nearest whole number. So uh, we did that by uh, putting int in brackets, and then gravity. And that pretty much turns gravity into an integer. So, and we're going to do the same for graphics 2D. We're going to be casting our graphics G object into a graphics 2D object. So to do that, we'll type graphics 2D G2 equals, so we have to type in graphics 2D, then after the brackets type G. So there we go. Uh, we have created a graphics 2D object by casting our graphics G object into a graphics 2D object. So yeah, anyway, uh, now we're going to uh, call a method and uh, I'm just gonna type it and uh, I actually don't really have a clue what the, this method I'm about to type means I'm not really sure how it works or anything or like what it means what it outputs 
I really should have looked it up now that I think about it. But yeah, anyway, I'll just type it. And if you're interested, you can look it up. So uh, type graphics or G2 dot sets composite. Then we type alpha composite dot get instance. And we have to specify an integer and a float. Uh, the float, which is the second parameter, uh, will be our alpha float. And uh, our integer parameter would be alpha composite dot source underscore over. I need to type alpha right. And there we go. That would pretty much set the transparency of whatever buffered images or rectangles that we're going to be drawing onto the screen from now on. So uh, let's say if we uh, draw a rectangle or a buffered image onto here, then uh, it would have transparency, and that transparency level will depend on the alpha float. So now we're going to draw the buffered image onto the screen. And to do that, uh, we do our usual. We'll type g dot not not set buffered image draw image then of course we have to put an image for our buffered image that we're going to draw the x and y coordinates will as usual be get x get y uh, the width and height of the image will of course be get width and get height and the observer is null so now uh, we're going to go and test this I'm uh, going to go into our player class and so we'll scroll down to our uh, invincible if statement in our tick method. And uh, in our invincible if statement, uh, we're going to add a trail every tick. So, uh, what we have to do is that uh, we have to actually uh, make another if statement and we're going to be checking if facing is equal to zero. Then, after that, we'll type else if facing is equal to 1. And why exactly we do that is because the buffered image we want to specify for our trail will be the way our player looks on the screen right now. And, uh, you know, to draw our player buffered image onto the screen, we actually have to check the facing variable in our render method. So Java knows which half of our player sprite array to draw. So that's exactly why we're doing it. So uh, in if facing is equal to zero if statement uh, we're going to type handler.add tile uh, the new tile will of course be a new trail uh, the trail will have uh, the same uh, coordinates and resolutions as our player so of course uh, the x and y coordinates will be get x and get y uh, the width and height uh, resolutions or variables will be get width and get height uh, the id will be Actually, uh, the tile uh, won't be solid, so uh, we'll just type false. The ID will be id.trail, which I'll create in a second in the ID in him because we haven't yet. The handler will, of course, be handler. And the buffered image would be game.player for plus frame dot get buffered image. And I'm just going to quickly... Uh, create a trail constant in ID right now because I haven't yet and I need to. Alright. And of course we have to import trail. Right, and there we go. And I put a game.player for plus frame because uh, we did the exact same thing in our render method where we were checking if facing is equal to zero. And we're pretty much going to do the same thing uh, for our if facing is equal to one if statements. So just copy the handler.add tile line of code and uh, just change game.player4 plus frame to just game.player frame. Alright, so if I've t if I've typed everything right, everything should work. So let's run our game and uh, see if it all works. Alright, we'll go get our star. And there you go. As you can see, uh, there's a trail of our player and, uh, you know, it's fading out as we go along. And it uh, looks pretty cool so yeah now uh, we got that done and uh of course uh, you've seen that it's ran out uh, once we're not invincible anymore now we're going to implement our particles so uh we're going to go into our entity class i mean package and uh, we're going to create a new class 
and we're gonna call it particle and we need to make particle extend entity and of course uh, implement the constructor and the abstract methods render and tick and now uh, because our particle has animation like in our player class uh, we have to and because our particle has uh, animation we're gonna have to be using uh, the frame and flame frame delay variables so we'll just go do that now uh, we're gonna create a private integer called frame and set it equal to zero and create a private integer called frame delay and set that equal to zero as well and we're also gonna be creating a private boolean and we're going to call it uh, fading all right and now we're gonna be controlling the uh, animation and you know the particles lifespan and the tick method and uh, if you remember when we implemented animation uh, we added one to frame delay every tick and uh, when frame delay was at a, a certain value uh, we set frame delay equal to zero and uh, added one to frame so uh, we're gonna make an if statement under frame delay plus plus uh, checking if frame delay is greater than or equal to two and if that's true then we'll type frame plus plus to add one to frame and set frame delay equal to zero to reset the whole cycle and also uh, under our frame delay if statement we're going to be checking if frame is greater than or equal to game dot particle dot length and if that's true then we'll set fading equal to true we actually should set fading equal to false when we initialize it and we actually want to check if our frame is greater than or equal to game dot particle dot length minus one because uh, as you know uh, Java when we're like working with arrays or anything starts at zero so the sprite in our uh, particle array with the index zero is actually the first sprite in the array and this and the second sprite will have an index value of one and uh, when we use game dot particle dot length uh, it gives us the num it gives us how many sprites or ints or whatever are in the array but starting at one like most people usually would. But we want the, the length of what our particle array would be if Java started counting the length of our particle array at zero. Because if we don't do that, then uh, our game will crash with an array index out of bounds exception. And uh, under this if statement, we'll also be checking if frame is greater than or equal to 13, which will be uh, the last frame in uh, the particle's lifespan. And if that's true, then uh, we'll just make our particle die. So now we're gonna go into our render method and uh, we're gonna make an if statement and we'll be checking if fading is equal to false. So put if exclamation mark fading and that'll make Java automatically check if fading is equal to false. And if that's true, then I uh, will just uh, call g.draw image. Then uh, we'll do our usual. We'll just have to type game.particle and the index is frame. And uh, you know, we have to specify uh, the usual coordinates and uh, width and height variables of course being uh, get x, get y, get width and get height, the observer is always null. Oh, what's wrong? Oh yeah, we're trying to specify a sprite for our image instead of a buffered image, which we have to do. So you just have to type get buffered image on the end of game.particle frame. Then after that line of code, we have to uh, type else no, not else, if just else. Because this line of code will only occur when fading is equal to true. And if that's true, then we'll type. Then I'll actually, we'll just copy this line of code. But things will be a bit different. Because uh, if you haven't realized, I drew uh, the particles fading in, but I haven't drawn it fading out. So what we have to make Java do is like, uh, we sort of have to, you know, I make the frames go up like this and then make it go uh, back down. So to do that, the index would be game.particle.length minus, and uh, put this in brackets, frame minus game.particle.length. 
And notice how I subtract game.particle.length from frame and not frame from game.particle.length because when fading is equal to true, then our frame will be greater than what game.particle.length is. So if we try to subtract frame from game.particle.length, uh, we'll get a negative value and, and our game will crash because our array cannot take in an index with a negative value. So what this is pretty much doing is that, well, let's say as our frame goes up, so let's say, you know, our frame variable uh, would be at this sprite. As frame goes up, uh, the image slowly fades out. So really it will go back down in our sprite array and Java will keep going down in our particle sprite array back to the uh, last sprite. So yeah, pretty simple explanation. I hope that made sense. My explanations make no sense sometimes. But yeah, uh, now all we have to do is uh, just now spawn the particles. So we're gonna go into our player class and we're going to make uh, another integer and it's gonna be called particle delay. You know, you're probably guessing it's gonna be, it's gonna be like frame delay. And we're only gonna be using this so we can make a particle spawn every three ticks instead of every tick just to limit the amount of particles that are being spawned per second. So, in our invincible if statement in our tick method, and uh, we're just going to add one to particle delay every tick. And we're gonna be checking if particle delay is greater than or equal to three. And if that's true, then we'll type handler.addEntity, uh, entity new, particle so this will so of course when particle delay is greater than or equal to three uh we would make our handler spawn a new particle entity and uh we have to set particle delay equal to zero uh to reset the cycle in which the, the particles are spawned now the thing is uh we want to sp we want our particles to spawn at a random x coordinate and a random y coordinate that's in our player's bounds or that's within our player so to do that our, our x coordinate will have to be get x plus and put this in brackets plus random dot next int because remember we already created a random object in our player class before so we'll just type plus random dot next int and get width so this is pretty much making our particles x coordinate a random amount of pixels across our player but still being inside of our player and we're going to do that uh, with our y coordinate uh, we'll put a comma then type get y plus random dot next int and uh, where we have to put in the brackets is get height and uh, the width and height variables of our particle will be I think let's make it uh, 12 and 12 actually we'll make it a bit smaller 10 and 10 uh, the ID will be ID dot particle which I'll quickly create now in our particle item because I haven't yet and uh, the handler will of course be handler and uh, we just need to import particle and that's it so now if we run our game everything should work All right, we've got to get our star. Hey, wasn't jumping. Hey, I did something wrong. Yay! And we index out of bounds exception. Oh, I think I know what I did wrong. And this pretty much relates to uh, why we type game dot particle dot length minus one, where we're checking when to set fading equal to true. So to fix that, uh, we have to put game dot particle dot length in brackets. And after game dot particle dot length, I'll uh, keep this in the same brackets as well. We have to put minus two. Actually, I'll try minus one. And we'll see how that goes. All right, we'll go get our star. No, I crashed again. I think uh, we have to actually type uh, minus two. All right, I tested it again. Uh, we still get a crash. So uh, I'm just going to pause the video and I'll come back when I figured out the solution. Alright, so I figured out the bug. 
Uh, the problem was frame delay had to be all in the if statement. Well, in the tick method in the if statement where we're checking if frame delay is greater than or equal to two. I looked at the code in a separate project. I just changed uh, the frame delay to three and it worked. I don't know why. You know, uh, in case you don't know how I make videos is that uh, I figure out the code in a separate project, which uh, has the same code as this Mario project. Uh, I figure out, let's say I was going to be implementing mushrooms. I would figure out how to implement mushrooms into the game before I record it. So I know what I'm doing and make things easier when I record. And I look at the uh, particle class in the other project and frame delay is greater than or equal to three. So I tried in this class and it worked. Uh, I don't know why, maybe it's um, the way like uh, it counts that, you know, maybe it checks some different ways somehow, I don't know. But anyway, as you can see, uh, when I get the star, uh, there you go, as you can see that uh, little particle effects uh, come out, but the problem is uh, they're not on top of our player, they're rendering actually behind our player. So we can only see it when it's at like the very end of our player's trail. And the reason why that happens is because uh, when we're spawning uh, our trails when we're invincible, all the trails they spawn on top of our player. So we're not actually looking at the player itself, we're actually looking at the, the trail for our uh, player when we're invincible. And one more thing I had to discuss, uh, you notice how I just uh, kicked that Cooper shell? Uh, well. The thing is, uh, if entities are out of the screen, then they don't update. So, you know, the Cooper just went out of the screen, it doesn't update. The piranha plants that are out of the screen, it doesn't update or tick. And, uh, you know, when I was implementing, uh, quote, better rendering and like a faster, you know, faster frames, uh, what I did is that uh, I actually uh, made all entities not update when they are out of the screen uh, for some weird reason I really shouldn't have so as you can see the creeper went out of the screen it really should be just about here at the moment and uh, you know if it still was updating it would have bounced back to me right now and going in my direction but uh, if I move uh, it starts moving then and that's uh, not what should be happening so and uh, the other problem uh, with the particles rendering is that uh, the tiles are rendered on top of the particles so when the particles are like in the middle of our player we can't really see them unless it's on the edge of our player or it's on it's on like the very end of our player's trail so to fix this you might think we'd render entities on top of tiles but uh, the thing is uh, we would actually see the piranha plants in our pipe when this happens and uh, we don't want that to happen and I'll uh, show you what this looks like now Alright, there you go, uh, the piranha plants are in our pipe, but, uh, you know, if they move down, we can actually see them in the pipe. And, uh, that's something that we don't want. So, uh, that's why we are rendering the tiles on top of entities, just because of that problem. And, uh, as you can saw that, uh, now because I'm rendering, uh, entities on top of tiles, you can see the particles are all working fine. But uh, when we render entities on top of tiles, we have the uh, piranha plant problem, which you can see right now. So to do that, uh, the solution is uh, to go into our handler class. Uh, we have to move our uh, entity for loop in our uh, handlers, you know, render method to be called before our tiles in our uh, handlers render method for entities to be rendered on top of, you no, know, for tiles to be rendered on top of entities. So what we have to do is that uh, we're going to have to create two entity for loops in our handlers render class. Uh, one called before the tile for loop, one called after the tile for loop. The first one will render every entity that isn't a particle. And uh, the second for loop will render entities that are particles only. So to do that, uh, we have to check if the entity's ID is not equal to ID.particle in the first entity for loop. So we'll just type ant e.get id does not equal to id dot particle and uh in the second entity for loop we have to check if e dot get id is equal to id dot particle and uh to fix that uh updating problem where entities don't update if, uh, if it's off the screen 
Just simply remove the for loop before the e dot tick line of code gets called in our entity for loop in our handler's tick method. So we'll go ahead and run the game and uh, we'll see if it all works. Hopefully it should. Okay, we'll go get the star. And as uh, you can see, everything works. Uh, the particle's being rendered on top of the uh, entity, our player. And uh, you know, our piranha plants are rendered like they should when they go in the pipe, we can't see them. And uh, yeah, everything's better. And one more thing we have to implement before I wrap up this episode. Uh, when Mario, in actual Mario games, get a power star, he usually is quite a bit faster than he usually is without a power star. So, or well, we're just going to make our player go faster when it's invincible and slower, and back to its normal speed when it's not invincible. So to do that, uh, we're going to go into our player class, and in our invincible uh, if statements, we're going to be checking if vel x is equal to 5 or vel x is equal to negative 5 and 5 or negative 5 is our normal walking speed for our player and actually uh, I'll put uh, vel x equal to 5 and vel x equal to negative 5 uh, in separate if statements and uh, you'll see why in a second so for the if statement at the end of each if statement uh, we're just going to set vel x equal to 8 instead of 5 and change set vel x 8 equal to set vel x uh, negative 8 in our other vel x if statements and uh, we put uh, each vel x if statement in separate if statements just to just so we know if we have to set vel x to 8 or negative 8 so we don't make like a mistake or something so and make our player go right instead of left or something like that see so yeah, anyway uh, at the end of our invincible if statement, we're going to make an else statement. And uh, we're going to copy these uh, two vel x if statements, paste it into the else statement after the invincible if statement. But in this time, uh, we're going to be checking if vel x is equal to 8 or negative 8. And of course, we'll set vel x equal to 5 and uh, to negative 5. So yeah, everything should work. Uh, let's run our game. All right, we'll go get our star. And as you can see, uh, we are going a lot faster than we usually would. Yeah, our player's moving a lot faster, right? And uh, when we're not invincible anymore, uh, we return to our normal walking speed. So yeah, I'm going to wrap up this episode here. I hope you enjoyed the uh, extra long episode. I don't think it'll be like as long as the mini bosses though, but it'll be pretty long still. So yeah, anyway. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like, a comment, and subscribe. If someone is interested in learning how to program a game in Java, or is interested in game devlogs, please let them know about this channel, I would highly appreciate it. And uh, remember to suggest what topic you want me to cover in the next tutorial. And if you have a Twitter account, please feel free to follow me on Twitter. So I'll see you guys soon. Bye.